coming to you from Santa Monica, which is not in Los Angeles, but, you know, in many ways might as well be California. I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. Today, speaking with Leila Lalami. She's the author of books like Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, Secret Son, and the new novel, The Moore's Account, which tells a much-told story from a new perspective, the story of the Spanish and their colonial adventures, misadventures into the new world, but from the perspective of a Moroccan slave in the party of one of these conquistadors. First of all, I I want to get a sense of, growing up in Morocco, what sense do you have of the sort of era of the conquistadors? What gets taught? Very little, actually. I'm trying to think now about history classes, and that part of history wasn't, I mean, obviously we studied, you know, Columbus and things like that, but really not in any kind of detail. Um, And I certainly would have remembered if we had studied a Moroccan explorer, which (laughs) we didn't. Mm. So when I came across the story much later um, of this group of conquistadors who'd landed in Florida in 1528 and heard that there had been a Moroccan slave among them and that he was only one of the four survivors and had managed to cross North America um, on foot, I was just really intrigued by that story. Mm. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to know more about it. Yeah. Now, was it a shocking thing to find out about that there were Moroccan slaves in in these parties? Not necessarily a shocking thing. I mean, obviously, uh, there were many Muslim people who arrived in the New World, mm-hmm. either in in South America or North America, along with. Uh, Spanish uh, conquistadors, uh, they arrived as navigators, they arrived as servants or, or, or as slaves. Um, and of course, you know, obviously during slavery in America, there were many, many uh, slaves that came here from uh, different parts of the Muslim world. Mm. But what intrigued me about that story specifically was that that expedition was not known for its success. It was known for its failure. Mm a resounding failure. And the only reason that we know about it is because um, one of the survivors, the treasurer of the expedition, a man by the name of Cabeza de Vaca, wrote a book called Chronicle of the Narvaez Expedition. And it's really the earliest uh, narrative that we have of Spanish exploration. And it's that document that makes this whole expedition interesting because it's one of the first narratives we have. It gives us ethnological detail about indigenous tribes that are now extinct uh, from somebody who was an eyewitness to these events. So it's just an interesting document in and of itself. Mm. And the other thing that intrigued me about it is that this Moroccan slave was only one of four survivors. Now, the other three were all Spanish noblemen. Um, so by... by um, they essentially had better rations. They rode horses. He didn't have a horse. They had all kinds of advantages. They had armor. They had weapons. As a slave, he would not carry weapons. So why did he survive? And all these other people died along with these three Spanish noblemen. So something about him struck me as different. Hmm. On top of that, we know from Cabeza de Vaca that he uh, learned a lot of these indigenous languages and served as as translator. Like he translated for them. Um, so there were many things about him that I found intriguing. The fact that he had crossed, he was one of, as I said, one of these only four survivors that crossed the North American continent, the first outsider to arrive in New Mexico, um, that he was this multilingual, very cosmopolitan man, that he survived where so many others had died. So there just was something about this character that I found completely engrossing and intriguing. And I thought that, you know, a novel is a, is a great way to explore him because it were so many narrative possibilities with this story. And this writer of the sort of official narrative of the expedition, Cabeza de Vaca, he's a character in the book. And is there is there something about what he wrote, about his work, when you read it, that, that itself screams out for another narrative to be told, an opposing narrative? Absolutely. Oh. I mean, one of the things that, uh, one of the, the first things that you notice about that book when you open it is that it is dedicated to the king, uh, Charles V, who was the holy, uh, um, his holy imperial majesty was his title. So it's dedicated to the king. And of course, the book is published in 1542. So there are certain social conventions to a book published at that time and dedicated to the king. And so the first thing that jumps out to you when you read that book is all the silences, the silence around women, not 
a single one is mentioned in these books. It is as if these men had lived for eight years among indigenous tribes and had never met one woman. Certainly never taken a native wife. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, so, so that's, that's an obvious silence. It jumps out at you mm -hmm. right away. And then the other thing too is that, uh, none of the indigenous people are mentioned by name with one exception. Mm -hmm. uh, the exception was a chief that actually was very clever and misled them so that they would leave his territory. Uh, that's the chief that gets named and then nobody else is named. They certainly don't get any, you know, um, agency in the book. And you will read lines, for example, where Cabeza de Vaca will write, um, uh, my Indians took me or I took the Indians. And it, there, it's just a very strange, uh, relationship where you don't, you don't, sense that they are really looked at as um, as having any kind of agency, especially in the first part of the book, although that changes once they become servants to indigenous tribes, so that changes a little bit. Um, and then, of course, what's interesting, too, about the book is that all of the failures of the expedition are attributed to Narvaez, who, of course, by this point is dead, mm -hmm. This is 1542, mm -hmm. and cannot defend himself or provide an alternative account. So, the, th the four survivors are essentially victims of poor decision making by other leaders in the expedition. And that too struck me as being a natural part of storytelling where if you're the one telling the story and you're coming back to Spain and you're facing the king and you're hoping to get another license to go back to South America and become governor of a territory, you would want to show yourself in a certain light. You would want to show your, that you are the person who's making the correct decisions or predicted that these decisions weren't going to uh, work out. So, so all these, all these gaps to me were very ripe for a retelling. And the only way to do that was to write a novel. Despite the sort of self-glorification of the people on these expeditions, you know, the, the ones who have left behind these narratives like Cabeza de Vaca, mm -hmm. how did he end up with that name, by the way? It's, people are going to be wondering. <laughs> he, uh, so he's a descendant of uh, a man who had fought for the Spanish crown and had been given that nickname, Cabeza mm. de Vaca, Cal's Head, and that name stuck through three generations until our hero now named Cabeza de Vaca. It's a name that survives today. There are a lot of people who are named Cabeza de Vaca. When I meet one, I'm going to be very impressed. But <laughs> they, they've left behind self-glorifying narratives with convenient omissions and all this. And, but it still seems that history at this point, especially in, in America, has, has, it doesn't look very kindly upon the conquistadors. It's more like, well, these, you know, at best they're kind of buffoonish, at worst they're more savage than the quote-unquote savages that they encountered. Uh, history remembers them as dead pretty crazy sometimes. I don't know if you've seen Werner Herzog's movie, Aguirre, yes. The Wrath yes. of God, but that's kind of the image of the conquistador is just this nutty guy with delusions uh, who leads himself and everybody into certain death. Mm. What do you want to introduce to that idea of the conquistadors, the one we have of just savage buffoonery? Uh, what, what is important? What makes that story more interesting? Or what, what needs to be corrected, I guess, about that? I mean, I don't know that, that the image that we have of conquistadors is that of the savage buffoon. I feel like this, this, although we don't use that term, I mean, Columbus was a conquistador, so was Cortes, and we certainly don't think of them as buffoons. They're but it's turned against them, sort of, right. history. Yeah. But, but they're remembered, they're remembered as men who, men of daring, mm. um, who so conquered hard. these huge, huge swaths of territory, even though they had very few men with them. But, and, and definitely somebody like Werner Herzog is somebody I see as providing an alternative to that, to that view. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I find interesting about it is that we do have this myth of, of men, men, white men who go into these other territories, conquer the natives, bring civilization. And yes, a lot of people die and there is this genocide that happens. Mm -hmm. And then the new world begins in this in this sort of very violent encounter. But the story is a little bit more complex. For example, with the idea that we think that it is a group of white men. I mentioned earlier that there were slaves mm -hmm. that were brought on the expedition, but not just slaves. There were plenty of people who were not what we would consider today white. Right. There were people who came because... 
I, I joke that these expeditions were like the software startup companies mm-hmm. of their yeah. day because you had to, you, if you had a skill that was needed in the new world, that was your investment to that expedition and you went and if, if the expedition, if things worked out, then you could become very wealthy. And if it didn't work out, well, then that's what risk is all about, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I think that there is this myth that it was just white men, and it, that's not true. There were plenty of people of color that came. There were women that came. Um, Two things that Werner Herzog includes as well. Yes. Is there's a black man, there's yes. women, which surprises a lot of people yes, still. Yes, yes, yes. And that's because when the history got written, we get these documents like the one by Cabeza de Vaca. Uh, and because, again, of the social conventions of the day, those those are the documents we're left with. And because we're left with these documents, people think that that's it. That's all that happened. These white men showed up and then that's all that happened. So there's all these other stories that somehow... Um, even if they're not, even if they're recorded or not, don't get as much attention. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that one of the things that interested me in this novel is to sort of sub- subvert all these myths of exploration. That it was something that white men did. Well, no, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And that also that, that indigenous tribes were essentially victims and played no part at all in what happened when in fact they did. I mean, when, for example, with Cortez, he could not have he could not have subdued um, that empire if he had not made alliances with certain tribes against others. If he did not have La Malinche, if he did, so there 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 is a role that is played by uh, indigenous people that I think I also wanted to include in the story to show that they're part of the story and to to have so 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 in the book, for example. The indigenous characters all have names. They all have lines of dialogue. Women are included. So there's, it's a lot more complex than what you see in, in the accepted narrative. The other fascinating historical question to me has always been the linguistic one for the, these, ex, these expeditions because I, it's natural to wonder how did, how did they communicate when they shared no language at all? And you know, I've heard stories about some of the more successful expos, um, I keep wanting to say exposition, exposition. Some of the more successful <laughs> expeditions so that, you know, they could pick up the occasional Spanish sailor shipwrecked from before who would translate, who had sort of gone native, things like that. Yes, but yes. in this expedition, mm-hmm. uh, this, the sense is that they, well, they didn't communicate. They just sort of forced, the communication was more of a forcing of their meaning, uh, upon the natives and just hoping for the best. I mean, they, they're convinced that the natives have told them where the gold is when they had no way to communicate anything, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's an interesting aspect of this expedition, too. So when Cortez landed in um, in Mexico, he did, in fact, encounter sailors uh, that had been shipwrecked. And one of those men who had learned languages because he had lived there for, for several years along with this indigenous woman and other. So, so he had different people. Cortez had different people that helped him with the different languages that he encountered as he went about subduing uh, that empire. But when Narvaez landed in Florida, Cabeza de Vaca tells us there is, there is no official translator. There is nobody who knows uh, these languages, at least not in the record that Cabeza de Vaca had left. Um, so there is a lot of guesswork going on. Now it's clear the men want gold and are looking for it, so they'll show it to indigenous tribes and ask. So it's not, it's not that it's impossible to understand one another. Certainly you can, but of course the 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 misinterpretations, the possibility for misinterpretation is multiplied. Mm. <laughs> and so they, so whatever indigenous tribes told them, they understood or misunderstood. And the other thing too is that in Cabeza de Vaca's book, he will say, oh, we asked them to, to take us to where the, the gold was and they took us to the next village and so on and so forth. But it's really unclear how they got these people to show them where the gold was. So I'm sure there was a lot of coercion. And that's another thing is that when there is coercion, then that affects communication because then you're not getting, you're getting the things that you want to hear. So their conviction became what they 
heard, right, quote unquote. Right, right. I mean, we all know there's no gold in Florida, but at the time they really, <laughs> they thought, and it, this is the other thing too that fascinated me about this book was that the, when they, when they first land and find a bit of gold, the bit of gold is described by Cabeza de Vaca as being small enough that it could fit in a child's rattle. <laughs> and I could not believe that these men disembarked because of that tiny little bit of, you know, of gold. And then they went on this whole thing. That's what started it. And, and that's because when you, when you know something, you don't really question uh, what you know. And, and, and Narvaez was convinced. He knew there was gold there. Yeah. So then he went to try and find it. Like it didn't even enter his mind that maybe there was no gold. Um, <laughs> so, so it's kind of the same thing. You know, you, you see this all the time where we have this, um, confirmation bias where you pay attention only to the evidence that confirms your beliefs. And so since he knew there was gold, you know, the fact that he found a little bit of it, that that only meant that, that, that there would be more later. So this seems like a theme in all of your books that when you have a hope for something and the hope shades into faith, <laughs> there's a the, the, the faith that it's there, whether yes. it's a better life in Europe yes. or whether it's if I convert to radical Islam, yes, maybe yes. life will be better. Yes. Um, I mean, this is, is this, is this a phenomenon that fascinates you independently of the story that it is expressed in? You know, the sense of, I want this. Oh, but wait, somewhere along the line, I believe that I am on the definite route to it now, yeah. despite any evidence. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's because I'm one of those people that, that, I just have a hard time um, how, how to put this. I always think, well, this is true, but then on the other hand, this could also be true. Okay. And, I, <laughs> and I find that I'm surrounded, like it's just very difficult because a lot of people seem to be very sure of what they believe. You're and I'm like, in a very non-conquistadorial way. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I know for a fact is that I don't know. Uh, That's the only thing I know for a fact. And I'm always fascinated by people who know. Mm. And I guess you could say that that's something that I've explored in different ways. Like, so with the first book, with immigration, this, this belief, and I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen um, people who really convince themselves that life is going to be better on the other side. And that's what keeps them going. Um, and they know it. With not a lot of way to get information. I mean, I was hearing an immigrant story from the 70s the other day from Korea to Los Angeles. Somebody mm -hmm. said, my dad was a dentist in Korea, heard that UCLA could offer him a short program to convert his dentist license to an American one. I was like, that's not a lot to go on to pull up your whole family to America in like, but it was, and it was enough to go on. Yeah. Well, but I mean, that's because we said this idea that, that the, that everybody hears about the American dream, which is promoted in, in all these movies and, and books and, and articles. And, and I think that this is the, when you hear an idea that's so seductive like that. Whether it be a religious idea or just an ideal, it could be a political ideal, could be a religious ideal, could be, could be a capitalistic ideal. Mm. But you then start to disregard all other pieces of information that contradict it. So it's not as if, for example, with the immigration question, with the first book, it's not as if people don't have access to, to information. I mean, they know, they're very aware of the danger. They're very aware of the pitfalls, but those things don't register as much as the success stories. And once you have that one success story, you think that's, that's going to be me, that success. I'm not going to be one of the, I'm not going to be a statistic. I'm going to be a success story. So, so I think that's, that's what I find really interesting is how we go about sort of processing that information and, and, um, choosing which ideas, uh, we're going to put our faith in. The narrator of your novel, of the Moore's account, the, the the account writer in question, the the Moroccan slave who takes the Spanish name Estebanico, mm -hmm. he, he's probably the group's biggest skeptic. I mean, what what if we can if we can use that term in this context? What what makes him a what has made him a skeptic? Well, because um, first of all, when you look at his life story, so in the in the novel. Um, I knew he was going to be the outsider. Obviously, he's a slave. He's not part of this expedition. He's whether they find gold or not, that's not necessarily something that could affect his fortunes, although he hopes that it will. Um, and so in the book, 
I go back to his birth in Morocco and kind of write about how he ended up on this expedition. And when you look back at his life, you see that he himself has fallen for these uh, false ideas before. And so, he, and also he was a merchant. He's a very worldly man. So, um, and he's kind of the, he's sort of the observer. He's the person who's on the side, kind of silent and just watching. And if you're quiet and you just watch and you're not actually taking part of the conversation, taking part in a conversation, you do start to notice things that maybe people who are engaged in the action are not noticing. Um, so that's his perspective. That's how he approaches um, the discovery of the gold with, with some skepticism. You know, he, he hopes certainly that they're going to find it. In fact, for the first few chapters, he's very excited because it's impossible not to be excited. Everybody around him is very excited. Mm. But pretty quickly, once they realize that once he realizes that there was no gold in the capital, that's it. He realizes the whole thing is, has been a sham, um, even after Narvaez continues to insist that there could be a way out. So His background has made him, yeah, it's a clear-eyed observer of all that, but it's also made him, it's given him some linguistic aptitude as well. He mentions coming from a trading city in Morocco has given him a knack for languages. Right. And I wonder what... I don't, I'm not quite sure how to put this, but here in, in the Moore's account, we have, uh, we have an account which I'm, how do you think about it? Do you think about this as a book, as a narrative that this character wrote in Spanish that you have written in English? Or what do you, what do you, how do you think of, how do you think of it as having been written in the first place? Did he write it in his native language? Mm-hmm. 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 So, so this is another myth, right? Mm-hmm. About, about Spanish exploration. If you look, at the books that have been written by Spaniards, or even if you look at some of the Hollywood movies, mm-hmm. where it always cracks me up that they give them um, they give them British accents. <laughs> yes. It's Europe, I guess, kind of. <laughs> but in any case, everybody speaks the same language. You would never, in a million years, yeah. guess that that multiple languages are spoken on any expedition. Yeah. And one of the things I wanted to capture in this book is what it was like to have all these multiple languages um, being spoken. This is a moment of cross-cultural encounter. Mm. One, the likes of which I don't think the world had seen before. I mean, it's so brutal and so unexpected. And all these languages are being spoken at the same time. You have the Spanish of the, of, of the leaders of the expedition, but you have Portuguese mm. and you have Italian and you have the languages that, that, that the North Africans are speaking. So in the case of my... My character, he speaks Arabic, but he, because he went to school, but his native language is Tamazight. So, mm-hmm. uh, so there's all these languages being spoken and then the indigenous languages in all their varieties. Mm-hmm. So in the book, the conceit of the book is that he's writing it in Arabic. And then and asides then, to his countrymen as well. So yes, it's for yes, them. Yes. Yeah. And, and through the magic of fiction, <laughs> because I write in English, it's rendered for us in English. Right. Um, as a modern novel. And that's actually an interesting thing because to me, this is a book that could only have been written right now Hmm. because, you know, now five centuries later with, with the perspective of time and with the fact that I'm using this form of the novel and I'm writing it with, with all this distance, I'm able to include all these languages and all these things that, and I'm, you know, I can do things with the novel that maybe if it was written 200 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do. So it is very Mm. much, even though it's a historical novel about that moment in history, it is a novel about the now because it comes from the now. It's kind of, you know, um, so, so, so those are some of the things I wanted to do with languages. I really wanted to give the sense that all these languages were being used at the same time. And this is one perspective from this Moroccan slave. And if you can imagine that two people who speak the same language can misinterpret one another. Imagine if you have half a dozen languages being spoken at the same time, mm-hmm. how many different perspectives you would get and how many possible interpretations or misinterpretations you could get. Um, so My mind goes back again to the, the shoot of Aguirre, the Wrath of God, when from what I've heard, every you know one person spoke German, one spoke Spanish, one spoke English. <laughs> they, were, they shot it in English, kind of, and then dubbed it in other languages again. But the same sort of Farago of languages, but I, what I wanted to get at was, since you, since you're able to write novels in English, a non-native language, 
what what do you think it's an advantage that that linguistic distance does that give you an advantage to write a story like this you know writing in english having some distance from that but being able to write a novel in it writing a scenario where everybody is at some linguistic distance from each other does that are those two things related does one help you do the other or is it coincidental just because english is the language you write literature in I mean, I, I suppose it's a bit of both. Mm. It is a bit of both. I mean, it is the language I write in. I'm a, but even though it is the language I write in, I I, uh, I use that. I use that to see what I can do with it to inform the narrative. Mm. And I, you know, I speak Spanish, and I, I mean, I, I am a linguist by training. I've always been fascinated by language, and it would have been impossible for me to write the story and not include all these linguistic aspects of that of that. Uh, cross-cultural encounter. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just so fascinated by that. I remember reading you writing about living in Los Angeles and learning Spanish here, and mm -hmm. not just to order tacos, which is the usual sort of, <laughs> I feel, caliber of Spanish again. But what uh, did... I feel like learning... Knowing Spanish now can't help but inform your view of, of this story. Like, even though you're not writing it in Spanish... Did it contribute anything to writing a story that rooted in sort of Spanish culture in some sense? Well, for example, in the book, um, so my character Mustafa, whom the other Spaniards call Estebanico, mm -hmm. he says that his master will often refer to him as el moro. Now, the word moro in Spanish carries connotations, not all of which are positive, mm -hmm. Um but the book is called The Moor's Account because it's written in English and Moor in English does not carry the same connotations as it does in Spanish. Uh, if the book were to be published in Spain, I can't imagine that I would call it, you yeah. know, like, you know, then that would be different, right? That right. would, that would carry it. So there's things like that. It that seems are, like an okay word in Mexico. People still use it there, but they, in Spain, it might have an issue. It is, it is. Um, by the way, there's, I don't know if you saw this story, um, a few months ago of a Spanish village whose name was Mata Judios, mm, which means yes. the kid, yes, <laughs> which is really frightening. And they had this, they had this poll, I mean, not poll, but I guess this, this referendum to decide whether they should officially change the yeah. name of their village. Hmm, you yeah. think? But, and so there was, so it made all these headlines because people couldn't believe that, that, that there was a Spanish village named Kill the Jews. Right. But, Matamoro is actually a last right. name. I mean, it's, yeah. you see it, you see it on, on businesses. It's something you that you see all the time. And it is kill the Moors and nobody thinks twice about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> um, it is a word that is, that, that has different connotations, I think, in Spain. And so in the book, he, uh, my character talks about that, talks about the fact that he is being referred to in this way. Uh, but in, in English, the word is different, and so um, he he thinks of himself in that way, mm. but without those connotations. So I, I uh, as we say, Mustafa Estebanico, he he talks about what it's what it gave him to to come from the place in Morocco that he has. But I want to get a sense of when you realized that where you grew up in in Morocco was also sort of a convergence of cultures. Was that present from the beginning for you, or did you have to reflect upon it later? No, it's not something you think about when you're growing up. I mean, life, it is what it is, right? <laughs> to quote V.S. Snipe, the world is what it is. <laughs> um, so you, you know, you grow up, you know, hearing one language at home, hearing another language at school, and yet another language on television. Um, the opposite of what Americans get, yeah. it, essentially. <laughs> Pretty much. And then, you know, these, these, you know, when I was growing up, I know, you know, my grandmother was this very, you know, religious woman. My parents were not religious at all. So there was like very different, uh, ideas were, were circulating in our, in our household. Uh, and it was only really later that once I came here, especially, and you see that Americans have such, such trouble with foreign languages and you can't figure out, but why? And then you realize, <laughs> well, a lot. <laughs> yeah, foreign languages are not taught, you know, and, and are not taught until later. You know, I, 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 in my grade school, we did two languages. And then in, in, uh, um, high school, I started English. And then in college, you have to take yet another language. I mean, 
And they use this immersive method. So from the moment you enter class, you cannot use a word of your native language or any other language of the one you're studying. And they don't do that here. So of course, yeah. you know, the kids are not, you're not, they're, they're not really learning all these languages. And they don't, they, they, they don't need to. As they soon as, feel like yeah. they don't need to. And, yeah. and I think that that, that's a message that's communicated to them by the culture at large. Yeah. You know, America's number one. Why, if you are at number one, why do you need to learn anything? You're already at the top. It's true yeah it's, so so there's this sense that you know everything is just perfect this is the best country in the world and right. so if it is that way then why do i have why do i have to learn anything about the rest of the world and so that's mm-hmm. definitely not how i grew up nobody in my entire life ever said morocco is the best country in the world <laughs> we don't have this sort of worshipful yeah. attitude towards the military either and so all these it's just a very different culture and so i think because of that um and also because of its history and the fact that it was in the 20th century was colonized, it it uh, it imbues the culture with a certain uh, sense of recent uh, recent humiliation is the best way I can put it. And so people really sense that they they their country we need to learn more about the rest of the world. Wow. We need to be open to the rest of the world as opposed to a sense of like. We are the number one country in the world. We don't need to learn anything about anybody else. So it's just a very different culture, a different attitude towards other cultures and other languages. Um, so I didn't necessarily think of it as being at the confluence of cultures until much later, and also because of its geographical position right at the tip of Africa and uh, so close to Europe and also part of the Muslim world. So there's all these different cultures that are mixing at the same time. It, I think of something a friend of mine who writes a lot of books on places said once about America. He says, if Americans don't travel, we're like a man living in a hovel who assumes everybody else lives in a worse hovel. There's that. So there's, I mean, I, I grew up in a, in, a, in a time in America when it was, there was less openly we're number one type talk, but it was still like, America had become sort of self-flagellating by this point, the 1990s, but it was still like, there's still a lack of aware. I remember reading something, another writer uh, writing about, I forget what, but he described a character with hair the color of an American school bus. And it weirded me out to see the word American used as an ad. Like, obviously it's American. Like, it's, that's some, it's the, the assumption that something is American unless specifically it's American until proven otherwise. That's more the sense. And I guess there's a sense of you don't really, you feel like you don't need to be as aware that there are other countries out there, but you can't not be aware of that in Morocco, right? From the moment right. one, you know there's other right. countries. Right, and and not least because, for example, when you turn on the television, um, you will get all these channels. So you will get, so the Moroccan channels, you will get North African channels, you get Middle Eastern channels, you get uh, Sub-Saharan channels, you'll get, you know, European right. channels. So it's, 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 you get all these different views. When you turn on the television here, everything's in English and of course a few in Spanish. Mm-hmm. And, but you know, so it's not, it really isn't the same thing. And, um, yeah, so, so it just is, it's a different, it's, it's a different experience. And so people, I think people, people frankly here, people can be very insular because of that. Mm. It's such a disturbing idea. It's too. a big country problem. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's such a disturbing idea. We're number one. America's <laughs> number one. And yesterday, Julia... Do you hear that much of that in Los Angeles? I wonder. Well, I mean, I hear it on the internet a lot. Sure. <laughs> Giuliani is saying that America, that the president doesn't love America. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Like, first of all, who made him judge? Which, And then the well, other From what thing, I hear, he's an Indonesian Muslim. Yes. So, you know, it's a real problem. <laughs> but I mean, this idea that you must... Like that the only way that you can love your country is to basically say that it's number one. I mean, I find that shocking that, that, that the only way to love a country is to say that it's great. And I don't insist. Yeah. And I just, I don't, I mean, I don't think that's true. I think that your relationship with your country has to be one of, um, you would want to, to strive for the ideals, but it doesn't mean that you have to say that they're, that they're, that they've already been achieved. I just, I, I find the whole thing very strange. And I feel like there is a direct connection between all this chest thumping America is number one business and the continual slide of this country in all these different um, measures right. of health, infant mortality, you know, uh, 
all these things that, that are, you know, going on. If you know you're number one, you haven't worked that hard. Yes, exactly. And so, but, but, you know, number one, certainly not at, uh, you know, equality in the workplace, certainly not at the time that women are getting, you know, for, for maternity or fathers for paternity leave, certainly not at infant mortality, certainly not at all these issues. And, and people go around saying you're number one. That's it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to question anything. It's, that's it. It becomes almost like a religion, which I find very frightening. Yeah, well, the religion that drives conquistadors <laughs> to go die in the jungle somewhere. Yeah, I mean, very much. Tell me what, out of left field, I guess, but what, what is, the, uh, French is the language of what to you? French? Mm -hmm. The language of France. Sure. <laughs> What's France to you? Um, well, France is the, that's, that's an interesting question. What is it to me? I mean, when I think of it, I think of it obviously in terms of its relationship to my country, to my native country. So France is the country that colonized Morocco and from which Morocco gained its independence in 1956. So it is a colonial power. Um, and even though it was only in Morocco for 44 years, which is relatively short compared to other places where France um, uh, colonized, other French colonies, um, that disruption affected the entire modern history of Morocco. So, so mm -hmm. things like its education system and its economy and, and its culture. So, so there's that, that's the political aspect of France that I think of. Um, and then I think of other things too. I think literature, I think language. I certainly love to read French. I love to speak it. Um, I think of, of, you know, people like Rousseau, I think of Sartre, I think of all kinds of people that, um, that I admire. That's it really. I mean, it's, it's a number of, it's hard to, it's hard to, um, and then of course nowadays, you know, when I think of it, I think of it also in terms of, of people who, people like me, but who live in France. So for example, Moroccan immigrants and their children and grandchildren, mm -hmm who live in France and all the issues that I read about in the, in the press. And it's always, it's, it's, it's something that I read about constantly. Mm. Now, when you came to Los Angeles more than 20 years ago, I mean, did this place strike you as a confluence of cultures in the same way you came to recognize that your homeland is, or what kind of confluence of cultures is this in Los Angeles? Well, maybe not in the same way, but it's definitely a place where I feel comfortable because it has all these different um, cultures. So 40% of the people who live in Los Angeles, not only are not born in LA, but are not born in this country. And, and so everywhere, I don't have to, I, everywhere I look, I see other immigrants like me. So it is a place that at the very least feels comfortable in that way, that, that if you are going to be a foreigner, well, there's, Everybody around you is a foreigner, so there is a certain level of comfort there. There's the, no, there's no assumption that somebody has been deeply rooted here. You know, I mean, when you meet yes. somebody on the street, it's not like, oh, you're of, of, of this place. There's yes. always that detachment, which I like yes. very much. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, everything here is, um, I suppose you, 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 you can say that you're from here once you remember what used to be in, in <laughs> what building used to be there before they. I find that <laughs> difficult tore. to do sometimes. Though. <laughs> before they tore it down and <laughs> built another one, they're constantly building new things. Um, yeah. So it is, I mean, it is, it is a place where if you're sitting in a coffee shop, you can hear five or six different languages spoken at any one time and that. I mean, in my experience, people don't blink at that. It's it's a part of life here. Not just Spanish, obviously Spanish, but also all kinds of other languages. Um, and it is a part of life here. So was it immediately essential to you to learn Spanish? I wonder, when did you, when yeah. did you do that? Well, I mean, when I was growing up, we, we used, in the summer, we used to get these Spanish channels. So I, I actually... The language was familiar to me long before I started learning it. And then when I got here and I saw <laughs> and realized how important Spanish was, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to learn this language. And so I, uh, I took Spanish classes at USC and, uh, yeah. Now I, I remember you telling a story about before you came to USC, when you were making the decision to come to USC mm -hmm. and was it, correct me if I'm wrong, was some 
professor before you left say kind of try to talk you out of coming here because of the reputation for violent yes. crime America yes. has and yes. it's I think that's really true like why is violent crime why is the reputation for violent crime not seemingly that much of a t- deterrent for people who want to come to America because it would be for me I feel like oh so in other words if you went to another country and you heard about all the stuff you know you'd get scared yeah. it's, I mean I guess it's true it's strange my my so my professor he said that when he had gone to USC some years earlier somebody had gotten stabbed on campus, you know, and so that was really terrifying. Um, and believe me, stabbing is the least of it because yeah. <laughs> there are so many guns. There are 300 million guns in this country. It's, right. And I don't know if I had known that there ha- that there were that many guns, that that, I don't know. This is what I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not as if I hadn't seen Hollywood movies. It's not yeah. as if I didn't know that there were plenty of guns and guns were illegal in this country, but somehow... Until you come here and you hear it daily, all these shootings, you don't really realize um, how ingrained they are in American culture. I was young and foolish is the best way I can put it. I, it didn't register when he said that it was violence. Like, yeah, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go do a PhD. I'm not I'm not right. there to, you know, it's so it, it, you don't think, you know. Right. So, I mean, it, does, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like you made an irrational decision. I mean, because, of course, yeah, the. Violent crime is going to be number one in the news at all times yeah. in America, but yeah. how likely is a given individual going to be a victim of that? It's yeah. not ultimately very likely, yeah. but it is a very high media yeah, profile yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. And yeah. to me, f- friends who have more recently arrived in America ask a lot about guns and what I, how I feel about guns. And well, I sort of was born in America, so I don't have a lot of distance from that issue enough to form opinions on it, but I'm, I worry less about the guns in America than the sort of sense that Tell me if I'm wrong from your perspective, but it seems like it's more harmful the sense that we, we sort of fear each other so much in America. There's, we're not afraid of an external enemy. We're afraid of one another. And there's this assumption like crime will be done to you if you let it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a period in the mid nineties when, when the local news like ATLA and all those, they would constantly talk about home invasions. Oh, yes. That was Do you good. remember that? I wasn't living here at that time, but oh, uh, yes, God. I know. I know of the news phenomenon. weekly. They would talk about how it wasn't just it wasn't just that somebody went in and burglarized the home. It was a home invasion, yes. and they they led with it so much over a, maybe a two or three month period that I became convinced. <laughs> no surprise. That it was though. going to happen to me. I was. Yeah terrified. Yeah. I mean, I, w- I was like making, before I went to bed, I was making sure that everything was locked. It was very funny. Uh, there's a movie actually that just came out that deals with this very topic. Nightcrawler? Nightcrawler. Yeah, I love, I love that. Yeah. I, it was a good movie. I felt like they really showed how, you know, mm. the news can um, can be manipulated in that way to make you believe certain things. So, you know, and I, and I was in my 20s and pretty scared. So. Americans are filled with fear, certainly. Yes, I mean, yes. there's also, I say that it's mostly about fear within from each other, but I guess there is the fear of the Islamic terrorist. Yeah. And it's a subject you address in Secret Sun, which is how the question a lot of Americans have wanted to know, which is what, what is so, what makes, what makes someone want to become, uh, not a terrorist necessarily, but what makes someone want to turn toward a radical, uh, a radical faith in that way. I mean, it's a it's a question. A radical ideology. A radical uh-huh. ideology. Yeah. What? And it's a, it's a. Well, cur- that's the million dollar question. Yeah, right? it's a curiosity I mean, type of fear. Yeah, I mean, and that's a million dollar question, and I feel like it's a question that is. Uh, it's almost impossible to answer because the question itself leads to its own fundamentalism in the sense that you have some people who will tell you well it's obvious why somebody would turn to 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 a radical ideology like that it's in their nature it's in their culture it's if you read the quran it tells you right there what what you know so this is part of their religion and the, the two are really indistinguishable you could dress it up however you want but that's what it is so then so then people are going to talk about that religious aspect and then you have other people who's like it's not that at all it's not that at all. It has to do with the fact that there is high unemployment and we have, you know, a, you know, a, a failed political system. These, um, these tyrants are, are just so brutal. And, you know, there's all these political issues and all of these things. And then that it's not religion. So that's another way to look at it. And the truth is, is that it's all these things at once. It's all these things at once. I mean, I think 
that if you have a lot to live for, if you have a job, if you have, you know, hope in the future, if you think your kids are going to inherit a country that is better than the one that you live in at the moment, if you feel like your life is going in a particular direction, why on earth would you want to do anything to jeopardize that? You're not going to strap a bomb to yourself. No, no. Sure. But but if if everywhere you look, you see that there is no sign, no hope at all. I mean... The big, the big, we weren't seeing this 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Now, why is that? If it is true that it is merely the, the, the religious uh, aspect of it, then why weren't we seeing this 30 or 40 years ago? Mm. And that's because at that time, all these countries were coming, were, were, were still within one generation of independence and there was still a lot of hope and there was still a sense that things were going to get better eventually. Um, and they didn't. And then at the same time, all that, all those new ideas started coming from Saudi Arabia with Wahhabism and all mm -hmm. that. And so it's like, it's a confluence of all these things. It's these, these ideas that are very well funded and therefore they travel faster. It's the fact that these uh, Arab states have failed. And have not delivered the de the, the dem democratic um, systems that they have promised. Mm -hmm. So there's just no there's there's you know if you're if you're a young kid and it's you know you you you're unemployed you 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 know there's no job there's no hope there's no future. Why wouldn't you join? Why wouldn't you be touched by that radical ideology? And mm -hmm. and and this is where people kind of. Um, think that it has only to do with religion and it's not it has to do with all these things at once it's mm -hmm. it's a confluence of all these factors in what sense do you get when you were getting the yearly snapshots every other yearly snapshots of your homeland mm -hmm. of morocco i mean what sense do you get of i don't want to say the state of morocco i don't want to say the direction the country is going but i guess how people feel in morocco about the direction the country is going in is there is is there optimism about it or is there what what added, what sense of attitudes do you get whenever you go back it's it's interesting it's actually a mis mixture of optimism and pessimism it's very mm. odd um so for example the in terms of the corruption it is so unrelenting mm. and so uh, ubiquitous uh i mean it's present at every level of state services and it's present in everyday life mm. um to such an extent that everybody knows about it everybody's upset about it but it is what it is. You know, this, it's, it's everywhere. Um, so that leads to pessimism. So whenever you start conversations, whenever I go back and I start conversations, it doesn't take long before I hear a story about corruption. Mm -hmm. Somebody tried to go get some paperwork done. An official was being very slow and had, you know, had to be greased for the, for, for the paperwork to go through. Things like that. It's the water you swim in there. Yeah. And so, so. So that's that. But then the, strangely also, I feel that a lot of people, I feel like, for example, the king is quite popular, despite the fact that he has failed to deliver any serious um, political change in the country. He still retains all power. He still um, controls the military, controls uh, m most, uh, all the important state ministries, all that, but manages to remain popular Partly because um, the government is the way that it's set up. Any time the government does something and it fails, it's it's the fault of the government. Mm. But then the king is always around. You know, every time they show him on TV, he's doing some new opening, some new charity, some new venture, some mm. new. So he seems like he's doing all these uh, all these things. So 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 there's this sense that. Um, He's not at fault. Uh, and so, so, so he remains, to my surprise, I would say he remains quite popular. Um, so that's what I mean, that there is a sense of optimism and pessimism at the same time. And it, for, does that itself, does that itself constitute a part of Morocco as subject for you? The, as a subject for writing, is there a richness to that optimism, pessimism mixture or what it springs from? I mean, yes. I mean, I, I, I'm always interested in writing about it. I'm always interested in, in, in what is going on in the country, mm. um, particularly from a nonfiction perspective. Um, 
for fiction, it's quite different, obviously. Mm. Quite different. Mm. Yeah. But it's, do, do you see it continuing to be an element of, of your books? I mean, so far, so far you're three for three with, <laughs> with the Moroccan themes, <laughs> Moroccan characters, yeah. Moroccan perspective. And yeah. do you see that as something natural or something decided upon, I suppose? You, you, you decided to write in English. Yeah, Did you decide yeah. on Morocco's subject? Yeah, I mean, hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess, to be honest, I write the stories that interest me. Mm. And, like, for example, with this new one, I had no idea I was going to end up writing a, a book <laughs> that had anything to do with Spanish conquest. What, what did I know about Spanish conquest? It wasn't something that I had spent that much time thinking about before until I came across the story, and it was so incredible. I felt like I had to write about it. This next book that I'm working on, quite different. And very little of it actually takes place in Morocco. And um, so it's it just depends on what story I'm interested in. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it taking place in Morocco, and I wouldn't count on it not taking place in Morocco. Right. It just depends. <laughs> <laughs> There's something I wanted to make sure to ask you in this, which is a few weeks ago we had on this show uh, a writer you've written about, um, your fellow African novelist, Alain Mabanku. Mm-hmm. And, um, oh, yeah. he, we talked, he, we had to talk, I had to ask him about Tintin, uh, Tintin oh, yes. in the Congo, because yes. people love that book there in the Congo yes. and he, he likes it too. Uh-huh. Americans, of course, think it's racist and yeah. didn't want to have it published in America yeah. for 60 years or something. But, oh, really? It wasn't published in America? Yeah, it was, I was, as a big Tintin fan, I couldn't get that or the one, the first one in Russia, uh, for a long time. Uh-huh. They just didn't get reprinted here. Uh-huh. And then re- more recently, we've sort of become more enlightened about mm-hmm old Belgian comics, I guess, yeah. but you've written in, in some piece about looking back on the Tintin books you read as a child and getting some new perspective from seeing them as an adult. What what perspective was that, that sort of Tintin in the Congo or Land well, of the Black Gold gave you? Well, here's the thing. When you read books like that, when I was reading Tintin mm-hmm. as a little girl, of course I identified with Tintin, mm-hmm. right? He's the hero. Mm-hmm. He's the clever one. He he discovers all, you know, he solves all the mysteries. Mm-hmm. He does everything. So he's the hero. He's funny. I'd love the dog. You know, it was, <laughs> I was gonna say, it's right? I mean, um, Milou, I think, is in French. Yes. yes. Um, so, of course, I identified with Tintin. I had no idea when I was reading something like Tintin in the Land of Black Gold that the people with the big lips and the hook noses and all that, that that was supposed to be me. Uh, and it was only later that I thought, wait a minute, I'm not Tintin in this story. I'm these other people. Mm-hmm. And um, that's when it dawned on me um, what was going on in these books. But, of course, entire generations of, of formerly colonized peoples have read them and have had that identification. And when you are a child and you are taught to identify in this way with another culture. It is not a bad thing. It is good to identify with another Mm. culture. But the problem in this case is that the opposite never happens. Uh. There is no equivalent of Tintin that is being published in France where the hero is a North African and the French are presented in all these stereotypical ways. And the French are reading this and saying, yeah, we agree. This North African hero is like really, really good. There is no balance to that. Mm. And so the empathy only goes one way. It never goes the other way. And then when you question that, you become the bad person. Why are you being so politically correct about Tintin? <laughs> so, so, so you can see it's, um, it's, it's a problem. Problematic. Do you think we're getting into an era where in some form or another, there can be that sort of North African Tintin where, where the, where it doesn't matter, where the origins of the uh, protagonist don't affect who reads it so much, if you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know that there can be a North African Tintin because Tintin is such a, it's such a Belgian. (laughs) For better or for worse. But I mean, but but like cartoon, I mean, you know, like comics with North African heroes, of course, of course there are. Um, And of course they would be informed by their time. Tintin grew out of a very specific era and grew out, it reflects that era along with that era's colonial views about these people. If there were to be a North African uh, comic equivalent to it today that would be quite popular, that everybody would be reading, it would have to come out of a very specific culture. And that culture is not the dominant one right now. So, Mm. of course, it's going to be very, very different. Mm. Yeah. But then we are living in a time where we have your novel, The Moore's Account, in in English, in English, written in English with a North African protagonist, right? Yes, yes, of course. 
course, I mean, there, there's all kinds of things that are happening that are very exciting. I mean, in, like, in, just off the top of my head in the world of comics, the new Ms. Marvel is, is Kamala Khan, who's a, a Muslim teenager who's a superhero. And that, that is exciting. There's a lot of exciting things happening. It's just that it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. I've been speaking here in Santa Monica. With Leila Lalame, she's the author of Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, Secret Son, and the new novel, The Moore's Account. Leila, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the LARB at lareviewofbooks.org or with me at colinmarshall.org. Thanks.